Welcome, and thank you for joining us for this post-election symposium, Telling the Truth 2020, presented by the New York State Writers Institute at the University at Albany. My name is Paul Grandal. I'm the director of the Writers Institute, and I'm very privileged to welcome Yolanda Carraway, Leah Daughtry, and Mignon Moore, our special guests for this event. There are three powerful and influential women who have worked on political strategists as political strategists behind the scenes together and sometimes separately for more than 30 years. They walked, worked on several presidential campaigns, including those of Jesse Jackson, Bill Clinton, Barack Obama, and Hillary Rodham Clinton. They're also the co-authors of this amazing book, For Colored Girls Who Have Considered Suicide, along with Donna Brazil. Uh, they're here. Um, we appreciate being here. Welcome, Leah, Yolanda, and Mignon. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Yeah. So I, I want to, there's a long list of accomplishments and, and honors that all of you have won, but I want to get right to the conversation. So um, just full disclosure that this is being pre-recorded. It's October 22nd. It's tonight is the, the second and last presidential election. We're 12 days away from the actual uh, presidential election. So my first question, um, who do you think is going to win? <laughs> I'm, I'm asking for predictions because you know this this will air after the election so you want to be on on your game on this one i go for biden harris <laughs> i'm biden harris all the way all the way are you concerned at all about these polls with florida and some of the other swing states pennsylvania do you think uh uh there's any worries about uh, the electoral college coming down to a, a few votes in a few states like uh, 2016. Mm -hmm. Well, I think since we are all veterans of 216, we take nothing for granted. Mm -hmm. And we also know that, you know, you haven't won until you won. And, you know, I think this is an unprecedented year, Paul. So I think while we are cautiously optimistic, we also know that we have had to run a virtual campaign almost. Right. We've had to do things that are non-traditional in this race. And on each side of the aisle, I think people are fully engaged. We're just hoping that our people learn from 216 and we, we're looking behind the curtains, especially in these uh, quote unquote battleground states. So, you know, they're coming out, they're coming out in strong numbers, but you know, we used to have this uh, saying, the cities are not out yet. Well, the cities are voting now, so we got to see who else is going to show up. Excellent. <laughs> how, how about uh, Leah or Yolanda? Do you have any? Well, it's an unprecedented time uh, besides, you know, the, the angst in the country. Um, just generally, I think the, the, the pandemic, mm -hmm. COVID has really... Uh, put us in an electoral space that we really just have not seen before. Uh, as Mian was talking about the virtual nature of campaigning, you know, the fact that people have to decide when and how to vote and keep themselves and their families safe makes this a really hard one to know exactly what's going on. Um, now, what we do know is that as of this taping, 27 million people have already voted, whether by absentee or uh, in early voting. And it's about 12 million who voted early. And by this time in 2016, only 6 million had voted early. Mm -hmm. So we are seeing record breaking, record shattering numbers of people. But I don't know that that portends anything good for uh, or bad for either side. Mm -hmm. Both sides are turning out. Uh, Democrats have a slight advantage as of this taping in terms of the early voters. However, that's pretty consistent with what usually happens. And on election day, traditionally, the GOP has stronger in-person turnout. So, you know, you just don't know, but COVID is the monkey wrench that none of us really has any indication how it's going to impact ultimately 
of folks mm -hmm. turning out to vote. Exactly. I think it's interesting that I have I've uh, seen more, I think, than ever in my life, more pushes for voting. I mean, you ride down the street and you see signs on the buses. There are signs, you know, people have billboards telling you to vote. Mm -hmm. There's so much everywhere. So they're doing so many events, uh, mm -hmm. probably a lot more than they would have done if they had actually been able to campaign just because of the, the logistical problems. Mm -hmm. Um, so I just, I, I feel really good. I went, I went out this morning, I went to a store and young, a young lady waited on me and she said, oh, you've got on your Biden Harris t-shirt. I'm so happy. I said, did you vote? She said, I did. And I made everybody in my family go vote. Right. So I just, everybody I see is just like really, really very enthused about going to vote. That's great. So I, I think at least some of you or all of you worked on the Al Gore campaign and, and and we remember the the supreme court challenge and the challenge in florida and hanging chads and and very contentious and controversial do you foresee something like that happening again if it's very close and also president trump has already talked about not peacefully turning over power like we have throughout our history do you have any concerns about if it is very close um, about the disruption post-election. Mm -hmm. I think there's a very real possibility that we will not know the, po the results on election night, uh, given the numbers of people who are voting by absentee and the fact that in the majority of the states, you cannot begin to count the absentee ballots mm -hmm. until election day. Uh, and millions and millions, as I've already said, millions and millions of people are now voting by absentee, larger than anything we've ever seen before. So if states can't even begin to open the ballots until election day, and then they have millions to count, it's conceivable we won't have the answer, uh, the final answer on election night, and it may we may have to wait a day or two. I think there's one state that we can keep counting for 10 days. Mm -hmm. So we, if it's close, we'll be waiting those 10 days. But Ultimately, I think we all want every vote to be counted, um, and so that the you know the people have the the will of the people is set, and then we'll see. You know, I think once the electoral college meets and votes, if Mr. Trump is not the winner, he gonna have to go. <laughs> <laughs> The law is just not, there is no conceivable way that, you know, he stays just sitting there because he is no longer the president. And it's very clear after the Electoral College cast their votes. I mean, what are you going to do? Just, you know, lock yourself in your office? Then, well, that would be interesting. It's like, boy, bye. Never. You have to go. <laughs> you know, Paul, and I also think that there is a theory that's floating out there that this could be a very decisive election November 3rd, too. Right. And it is our prayer, our hope that it is, because if in fact it is, then it will be what you're going to do, Mr. Trump. Are you just going to Katie bar the door? But I think it has to be so decisive that it will not even come under question. But having said that, I do know that there are people that are prepared to make sure that, you know, wherever this wherever this comes down, you know, like in 2016, for example, we felt and we knew something was happening, but once Hillary conceded, you know, we almost kind of closed the door. We did go back and do a recount and that didn't reap much of a benefit. So I think what we have to really be smart about this time, if it is close, we have to make sure that we are keeping all options open to, to make sure that the voters know that their votes have been counted. Because I think the painful thing about what happened in 216 is there was never really any closure on Hillary's side. And we knew that it was foreign interference. We probably are, you know, I think it was an article that came out earlier this week where it looks like Russia is up to some more tricks. Right, right. So, you know, it's like you have to, you have to cross every T and dot every I in this election. And that's why, you know, while you'd like to be joyful, and I am, I'm, I'm like Yolanda, I'm very excited about the fact that everyone is talking about voting, which is rather unprecedented, right. but you still have that wild card. 
So I, I apologize. I think I may have misstated the uh, title. It's for <laughs> colored girls who have considered politics. Mm -hmm. And it is very- but We might consider suicide. suicide. If we don't win. <laughs> I know you take the title from uh, the uh, Shange's um, um, uh -huh. play, and um, but that term that you coined to call yourself "colored girls," how how did that start? Certainly, race and, and overcoming racial prejudice and inequality has been a part of your stories and, and and your professional and personal careers from the beginning. How did you come up with that title for the four of you who co-authored this book? Well, interestingly enough, um, the title was really not about race. It was really about our values. And it started with me and Donna Brazil in Boston. And one day we got the word that we would have to move our office. And so in doing so, when we moved our office, we discovered that, oh my God, we're gonna, one, we're gonna lose our seat of power. Two, uh, there will be no people of color or women on this floor, except maybe one, the, uh, the campaign manager. So when they all went out for their Friday cocktails, Donna and I decided to move back into a different office and we moved a table into that office. We didn't realize that it was the office that had been assigned to the chairman, but we decided we were gonna stay. And then we just put on a piece of paper, we wrote on a piece of paper for color girls, we shall not be moved. <laughs> but the irony in all of that, was that it became an office that represented fairness. It represented equity. So it didn't matter who you were. It didn't matter what color you were. They knew that that office was standing for something. And then we just kind of carried it on as we all became friends and you know, democratic politics. Or I think many people just started calling us the color girls. Yeah, they did. I yeah. Did you accept that? I mean, I, I would never say that it would be pejorative for a white man to say it, but is it is it something that you're com you like or you're obviously you're comfortable with it? And oh God, yeah. I mean, you know, the others can speak to this, but white men say it all the time. You ought to hear Terry say it. Terry McCullough. Here comes the color girls. I mean, he says it with glee. <laughs> and you know, we're very comfortable in our own skin. Yeah. You know, and most people know the difference. And obviously when you read the book, you will see the through line right. of why we are, you know, why we are named the color girls. Um, I'd like to, to explain this, the bank of justice that, that, that comes through in this book, that whole idea. Can you explain that for our audience um, and, and, and talk about maybe how that fits into this current moment of reckoning in the Black Lives Movement and, and how this, this moment seems to be raising awareness and, and this conversation around race. Well, since Leah was the Bank of yeah, Justice. I was going to say Leah the Bank of Justice. <laughs> <laughs> she was the Bank of Justice. Yeah. She was the ultimate Bank of Justice. In 2016. <laughs> <laughs> the Bank of Justice as a concept is about how we make sure that everyone has an opportunity and can come to the table equally. We know that uh, in the communities that we come from, people do a lot of hard work. People put their blood, sweat, and tears into whatever, in our case, the party is doing, uh, whether they're running campaigns, putting out yard signs, pulling out votes, whatever they're doing. But when it comes time for big events or when the payoff happens, like conventions, like inaugural Yolanda, like mm -hmm. all these other, right. then, um, you know, no, the tickets dry up. They don't have access. Mm -hmm. They don't have access. And so we created the Bank of Justice as a way to give those folks access. And so when we first created the Bank, I think it was 2004 or 2000 when we did the Bank of Justice. Mm -hmm. That's right. And it was about credentials for the convention. It was about how the people who had done the work Mm -hmm. can get access to the room where things are happening. Mm -hmm. And so we had a, a, a we would keep a, a, a stash of tickets, credentials, <laughs> whatever it was so that, you know, the folks who, who've been working knew where they could come in order to get into the convention hall. And Yolanda did the inaugural in, what year was that Yolanda? Um, 92. Three. And so she was the bank of justice for the inaugural. That's right. <laughs> okay, we need to take care of this donor. 
Mm -hmm. who had given money to the campaign, but maybe didn't rise to the level that, you know, people were trying to give them the right tickets or they needed a ticket to the ball, whatever it was. And so we just have carried that thread through. And it's really, we do the tickets and the credentials, but it's really about making sure that everybody has access. Absolutely, it's paying it forward. Yeah. And um, for those people who won't be able to get in otherwise, we always try to make sure they get in. It's paying it forward and it's paying it back. Yeah. yeah. Yes. yeah. People who have made ways for us, yes. make ways for other people, yeah. but don't often get their names called, don't often get the, the best seats in the house, don't often get in the house. The yeah. Bank of Justice is about making sure we pay it back, that we pay it forward, and most of all, that everybody has access. And we're hoping that it's a new generation of bank of justice serves out there. We're hoping that they're out there and they're heard of it. Yeah. You have to train them. Mm-hmm. And I mean, that's part of the threat of the colored girls is that there were times when the bank of justice was a rogue activity. <laughs> right. <laughs> we, had, we were <laughs> gathering tickets and credentials and whatnot from the people who had access to them. And we would get our stash together and make sure everybody got something. And then there were times when we were in the position to be the bank of justice. Right. Uh, and we didn't have to go to somebody and hope they would give us a stack of things to put in the bank, but that we were the ones, uh, Yolanda at the inaugural and me at the two conventions, mm-hmm. and y'all when she was at the White House, we were the bank of justice and could ourselves make things happen for people. Um, that's what I wanted to, you mentioned, you know, young people, we're a, a university of 18,000 students one of the most diverse public research universities in the country, um, but not as politically active as I, I would have thought. Are, are you seeing uh, encouraging signs with college students, young people getting actively involved in, in the political process? I think there's a lot of work being done with HBCUs. Yeah. I, you know, I know the campaign, uh, the campaign is uh, working with them very closely. I know that Kamala has been to a lot of them. Um, I, I think we're going to be good on our side. I don't know about the other colleges. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's interesting, um, and Yolanda's correct. I think it's a little bit mixed, Paul. You know, there, there doesn't, I mean, hopefully the enthusiasm will come. They are not showing up at the polls right now in early voting like we, we want, but that doesn't mean they're not voting. Right. And, you know, one of the things that I like to say all the time is that we have to, you know, we have a generation of young people that we have to invite in. They're more polite than we are. We just took us a seat at the table and then it hit a chair. We bring in a folding chair. They must be asked. They must be asked to participate. And so if they are listening to this, even though it's after the fact, I would encourage them not to ever let anyone take the power of that one thing that they can do, that vote, because it is so precious and so many people have died for that right for them to go in and cast that ballot. But I I feel like if they show up and show out, they will be the margin of victory for Biden-Harris. Right. Yeah. Right. I do too. What's interesting is that uh, in American politics, the younger generation is all, always lags behind uh, their, their voting strength. And that's not just today, you go back as long as records have been kept. They just don't seem to vote at their strength. I think we're seeing more political activism now than perhaps in other cycles because people have had to deal with COVID and the impact of that on their schooling, you know, student loan debt and other things that may have folks more energized, but we need to figure out as an American society, mm-hmm. what, are, what are the keys to changing what has been the trend among young people from time immemorial to just not vote at the level of strength that they could or should. Right. Um, the killing of, of George Floyd in, in May and, and this eruption of, of outrage and protests and demonstration uh, through the Black Lives Matter movement and other organizations, um, do you feel that this will be a, a potent force for several election cycles? Do you think it will sustain? Do you think it will have the kind of impact that the civil rights movement would have? 
Um, each you, of you, maybe, maybe Yolanda, start. Um, well, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm a child of the '60s, so I have been through similar uh, events, you know, all my life, pretty much. The difference I see this time is that it's far more diverse, and there are more people, you know, chiming in and coming in, and, and you know, in Portland, where there aren't even that many black people. White people are protesting. White people are protest protesting everywhere. I went down to Washington. I went to Washington, uh, the Black Lives Matter Plaza one day, and it was just really, it was really beautiful to see. I mean, they're all young. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I didn't think anybody there <laughs> was over 21. Um, they were, they were, uh, had their masks on. They were doing, you know, they were being polite. They were socially distancing. But they're, you know, th this, this is, I think this is their time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. This is their time. And I think that they, they've seen what's happened over the last four years to everybody, to the country. And it's, I think that they're just taking the courage and they realize it's their time to step up for everyone. You know, right. and I also think, Paul, that the energy has to be connected to the ballot box. And the evolution of just, if you just segment just the Black Lives Matters movement, in, two, in 216, when they popped on the stage, they were considered disruptors. Right. They would, you know, they disrupted Hillary's events, they disrupted Bernie's events to call attention to what they felt was the injustice. This year, they're taking a more proactive stand in terms of turning their energy and their movement into the ballot box. But Yolanda is absolutely correct. Black Lives Matters is the inspired three words that has generated a movement of young people that's actually very inspiring and encouraging. And I'm hoping that those protests will turn into actual votes because the, the movement is so broad now. And I can't say that it belongs to any one person I mean, Leah works with the, you know, she works with the church community and all her, they did all kinds of town halls before George Floyd got killed. So I know that there is a group of young people that are really active, but I'm hoping that the larger movement that we see is really going to propel us forward. Leah, did you want to uh, add to no, that? I think they've said it all. I don't know that, that I know. I think they've covered it. Okay. Um, so that was a, a tone of optimism. This is a time of, of such, you know, loss of 218,000 plus Americans and, and devastating economic uh, de destruction and this pandemic that is now in its second wave. Um, what do you find to be hopeful in this time right now? How do you find hope and, and, and find uh, you know, joy and, and positivity. Well, I think um, what's, what's uh, inspiring to me is the innovation that we see. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't mean that in the technological sense, but in the sense of how we have adapted mm -hmm. as Americans to new ways of being and doing and maintaining community. Mm -hmm. Even when we can't be out, um, I'm gratified. And we talk, we spend a lot of time talking about the knuckleheads who won't wear masks. Right? <laughs> they are annoying. I just want to beat them over the head and say, please put on a mask so we can all get out of the house. Yeah. But I'm really um, inspired by the people I know who've made a commitment to wear the mask, stay indoors, and do what they have to do, not because they don't want to be out, not because they, they don't miss their friends, but because they recognize their, their singular role in the community and in keeping the community whole. And that's really wonderful and, and, and inspiring to me that so many people are choosing to put community first. Mm -hmm. And we've adapted, we've had to adapt. We've adapted to a virtual events to, uh, we do, um, I, 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 we had my mom's 80th birthday party the other day on Zoom. Because she and my dad, my dad's 90, she's 80. They're on Zoom and we're having them. We've had to adapt and it tells me that we have the capacity mm 
mm-hmm. to learn and to grow and to do new things when we have to. So I, I, I find that inspiring. And besides, of course, I'm grounded in my faith, but I just find uh, the sense of community and the hope that's within people to learn new things and to be sacrificial mm-hmm. in this that's, moment. That's nice. Us. Thank you. Um, mm-hmm. Yolanda or Mignon, do you want to uh, add anything to that? You know, I'm Baptist. Or- so when you come behind the preacher. Yeah, right. <laughs> we don't come behind Leah. <laughs> you just say amen, amen, that, that Leah. Be amen just amen from me. <laughs> so I want to talk about Kamala Harris. This was historic. The first uh, black woman of a major party uh, as a vice presidential candidate. Have any of you worked with her directly or had any uh, direct interaction with her? Well, I guess we all have. <laughs> we know her very well. I mean, she is, um, she, not only is she a personal friend, but she is somebody that we admire and respect greatly. And it's a joy to see her not only assume this position, but ascend to this position. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so it wasn't enough for us as Black women to just, you know, rally behind her and, you know, push to have the enlightened ones put her on the ticket. We have also stayed engaged and each one of us are doing our part, like Leah said earlier, to help this ticket and to help get them both across the finish line because we are also uh, admirers of Joe Biden. And we believe that he's a fair, honest and decent man. And she couldn't have, I think in my judgment, my my humble opinion, she couldn't have a better better person at the top of the ticket, helping her learn as she grows into her position because he's already had it. So right. I'm really inspired by it all. Yeah, I am too. I've known Kamala. I met Kamala when she was a student at Howard. Wow. Uh, so you know how long ago that was. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I've just, it's been such, I'm a bit much older than she is, but, but um, it's been such a pleasure to watch her grow into all these positions. I remember we were together at a friend's birthday party, 40th birthday party a few years ago, and Kamala was saying she was going to run for, uh, was the first one she ran for, state district attorney. District attorney, yeah. And um, we were all excited about it. I said, oh, Kamala, I'll come run your campaign. <laughs> <laughs> Do that. Well, fortunately, she was smart enough to get somebody else to run the campaign. <laughs> But I just, I mean, I'm just, I am in awe, I'm in awe of her. I'm in awe of what she's become. I'm in awe of what she's doing. You know, every time I see her, I just get this big smile on my face. Mm-hmm. She represents, a, we, we call MVP. MVP is Madam Vice President, but she's she's, a, she's our MVP. She's our most valuable player out there right now. Yeah. And we, can, we, we need to remember that too. Mm-hmm. How about Leah? Did you want to add anything on Kamala? Uh, you know, I met her when she was um, San Francisco District Attorney um, before she became State Attorney General, um, and she's just always been, you know, a down to earth, um, grounded. I know her as a person of faith who prays and who is in uh, uh, relate has her own relationship with Creator God, and that's. Um, that's always important to me to know where people's values come from. And she's just a good, you know, her heart is, is right. Yeah. right. Her values are well-placed. And that just lets me know what kind of public servant she's going to continue to be. Mm-hmm. And those, uh, hopefully, and we, and we win and to see her ascend into that office and for the, what she's gonna represent for all the young people Mm-hmm. coming into the world my niece is two years old and she will now come into her awareness mm-hmm. with a woman vice president and what that will mean for her and for all the possibilities for the little girls and the little boys mm-hmm. who will grow up seeing that glass ceiling shattered and so not even knowing that there was a glass ceiling right, right. do you think she has the uh, certainly talent uh, skills, but also the ambition uh, to become the first female Black president. Do you think she can go all the way? I do. Yeah, I honestly do, but no I'm just trying to get her where she is right now. Let's get her to be VP. Let's, let's win this one first. 
I mean, I mean, I'm not putting the cart before the horse on this one just yet. I'll be there. I'll be there, but let's get this one done first. Fair enough. Again, the the book is for color girls who have considered politics. Um, I could see this as a movie because you you really write in vivid detail about what it's like on those convention stages, what it's like in these war rooms and behind the scenes. Who would each of you like to play uh, in the movies? Who what 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 who would want to to play you in the movie? Oh God, who did? I I, mine was Audra McDonald. Ah. Yeah, you look like her. That's uh, that's a. <laughs> I like her. <laughs> I like her too. I mean, she's a Broadway. Uh, she's a triple threat, really. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. She really. How is. about uh, Mignon? Who would you? I forget who I had. Angela Bassett, wasn't it? Yeah, oh. maybe so. That's that's a good yeah. call. Maybe yeah. She's like. How about you, Leah? Eddie, Eddie might like me. Yeah. Um, my choice was um, is Regina King, although she's you know she's big time director now, but that's who I, I love her. Yeah. That's great. How about Donna? Who would we cast as Donna? Didn't we say Queen Latifah? Queen Latifah. Yeah, we said Queen Latifah. <laughs> yeah. That's great. Is there any talk? Is there any uh, uh, movie options or anything in the book? Or. Well, this actually it started from a really funny funny place. This started as a, <laughs> first, a series and as we got into it it's a very long story but as we got into it we discovered that we didn't really understand or recognize our characters anymore and because of history and because there's so few of us at this level we decided to pull back and put pen to paper what we really stood for before the world saw us as these different kind of scandal like women so uh, the reason why we really have the book is because we wanted to tell our story. We wanted to leave something for young women to see. And now if we decide to do a series or a movie, they can take it any direction. At least they'll know the truth. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Um, so let, let's say that, uh, uh, you know, Biden-Harris wins on, on November 3rd. Regardless of who's in the White House, do you see this, you know, really divisive politics, probably unprecedented, the division between left and right, red and blue, um, this tribalism? Do you think that would all change on, on November 4th, even if it's a Biden Harris landslide? Or, or, or are these issues dug in much deeper than one presidential election? I don't think it's going to change. I don't think anything's going to change overnight. I mean, it's going to take time. It took us three and a half, well, a lot longer than that, but the last three and a half years we've really been focused on all of this madness. Um, I think it's going to take time, but I think what, what it will do is just having, having the nasty rhetoric and, you know, all of the, the craziness and the lying and everything else, just being able to get that out of the White House and have someone in there who is an honest person who we know will tell us the truth and be honest with us mm -hmm. uh, and lead the country in the right direction. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, what, that's what I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. How about Leah and then Mignon? Um, you, you, I think I agree with Yolanda, and I think some of the of the the nastiness that we're seeing, uh, particularly around race, uh, didn't start with Donald Trump. Right. He just made it okay for some of the races to to show themselves. So you know, this is this is 400 years in the making, and I don't you know, and I would not put the burden on Joe Biden to try and fix everything. I think what he will do just out of the strength of his own character and personality and who he is, as Mignon said, just a decent, kind uh, human being, he will be able to lower the temperature mm -hmm. and set a level of expectations on us as, as a country about how we treat each other and act just by his, if he doesn't say a word, just by his own example. Mm -hmm. Uh, and and we have been sorely missing that these last four years. Yeah. yeah. No, I think, um, lastly, Paul, I look back on when Joe Biden decided to get in this race and he decided to tell the telegraph to the country at that time, we are headed for a dangerous, dangerous path. And so for a white man, 
who really has a very complicated past with Congress and who has had you know, bipartisan relationships to say to the country, this white supremacy, this racism, that the thing that was happening at Charlottesville, we were all together when Charlottesville was going on. Thank God we were on our first vacation ever in life, but we saw it happening. But for him to telegraph that we have to do better, that the soul of the nation is at stake, said something to me. And I keep that in mind every time I start thinking about, okay, is this going to happen? I keep saying to myself, and this is where, you know, I appreciate us having a bishop in our little circle because I keep that in my spirit that he saw something and he decided to put himself out there when he knows that it could have been, it could have been the end of his campaign, not the beginning. Right. And so I felt like that was courage in itself. And if he ushers in that level of decency that he started with, like Leah and Yolanda have said, we have accomplished a lot. Then we can get back to fixing the economy for working class people and poor people. But, you know, and I'm with Leah, we can't put everything on him because we have a responsibility to help that. But he sure gives you hope that we're going to start in the right direction. Right. So, you know, checks and balances in, in this country and the government, you know, the legislative and judicial. That's right. Against the executive. That's also. Uh, up for grabs on November 3rd, uh, the United States Senate. Mm -hmm. Certainly we've seen this president, you know, trying to, to uh, turn the Supreme Court conservative. How important do you think the control of the Senate and the Supreme Court is to the whole agenda of, of Biden-Harris and, and, uh, and, and progressives? Uh, Yolanda? I think they're both extremely important, just as important as uh, the White House. Mm -hmm. um, the Senate, if we don't win the Senate, then we're still in the same place we were before. We can't get anything done. Mm -hmm. Even if he, you know, even if Biden wins, it's, it's still going to be a problem. We have got that. I, I keep telling people, please don't forget about the Senate. That is the second most important thing we have to do. And of course, the Supreme Court is important, but I just don't know at this point, there's, I think that's just a done deal. and There's not a lot we can do about it at this point. Aren't they supposed to vote on her today? Yeah. yeah. But how about uh, if, if, if he would add two new, uh, you know, two, two new justices? That's a, possi that's a possibility. I, I mean, the, we'll have to see, see what happens when the time comes. Right. Um, but that, that's a possibility. I mean, how about, you know, the, the Obama's two terms, he, he was so hamstrung by Mitch O'Connell and, and the Republicans not wanting to have any, any win. And, and Trump has spent most of his term trying to tear down Obamacare and any of Absolutely. Obama's victories. But do you think if, if the Republicans control the Senate will be, be a repeat of Obama's administration, which some people were disappointed in that he didn't get the agenda that, that he, he wanted? Um, Leah, why don't you take that one? Uh, well, I think it, it may be a bit different with Joe Biden because I think one of the, the, the underlying problems, and I'm not the first to say this, with Obama was the issue of race. Mm -hmm. And that some on the Senate side uh, were not comfortable with him being president. And it really started the first day when he met with the Senate in his first term and they told him they weren't going to do what he wanted them to do, which is unprecedented for a, for a new president. You generally give the new president some level of race. Um, so I don't know that, it, I, don't, I don't know that Joe Biden, he won't have to deal with those race issues. <laughs> he also is someone who's had a very long career in the Senate mm -hmm. and has some established relationship with some people who are still in the Senate. And so he may be able to navigate it a little bit differently from uh, an African American gentleman who had no, uh, who did not have as much experience with the Senate as Joe Biden has. So it, you know, it, you know, I, I, I'm I, I'm cautiously optimistic mm -hmm. that Joe Biden will not face as as uh, as the vitriol at least, mm -hmm. right. the vitriol that that Obama had to face. Um, you know, but you and know, we'll see. Was still maybe, there, you know. maybe, so, maybe a lot of them will be gone. <laughs> maybe. But you know, the other thing we, we forget is that Kamala will preside over the Senate. So she has history. So with her history, 
and Joe Biden. That's true. You know, I think it will make for better relationships. Mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah. We've got Obama's memoir coming out just after the election. Have any of you seen an advanced copy? Did you happen to, to get uh, any? I have not. No. Just saw the title. Yeah. Promise, man. I, I saw a uh, three million first printing in hardcover, which is, I think, unprecedented. Wow. I think it's going to be a huge book. Um, well, his competition is his wife. Wife. Yes. <laughs> Phil Arenas. You can't beat her. <laughs> so I'm I'm not not him. Oh, Obama. Oh, Obama. <laughs> Three million is a small run. Yeah, right, exactly. Three million. <laughs> um, so let's uh, catch up on, on, on what you're doing now. I, I looked at your website, some different organizations. I know you're doing different things. Uh, why don't we just hear exactly what you're working on right now? And, and, and I also want to hear about that first vacation you finally took together, these <laughs> hardworking political strategists. Uh, we'll start with Minion and go to Yolanda and then Leah. Minion, I saw you're, you've, you've got a uh, consulting group that you're working with. Yep, I work for the Dewey Square group as my uh, advocation. Obviously, doing these politics on the side is my vocate well my my advocation is the politics and my vocation is dewey square which is a public relations firm and you know the good news is we actually work on a lot of clients that we feel that we can do good by as well so we work on every issue from healthcare to you know just trying to uh, help corporations navigate this very tricky terrain about race and inclusion and so it's it's a wonderful company. I've been there uh, well over 15 years and uh, the people are great. So I'm having a great time, even great. in this environment. I've, I had to, I was one of the ones that had to adjust to being at home because I am a creature of the office as my girlfriends will tell you. <laughs> go home, Mignon, go home at 10 <laughs> o'clock at night. <laughs> How about, what, what are you doing currently, Yolanda? I am, um, well, I'm working, I have work. I, I, I had a, have a PR firm that I've had for over 30 years and kind of wound down a couple years ago. And now I'm really doing uh, kind of high level consulting. Um, had a lot of work recently around all of the, um, a lot of these corporations wanting to do something and not quite knowing what to do or how to do it. And, and mm -hmm. so I've been doing some of that uh, and then I'm on the board of Emily's List, and I, I do a lot with them. And um, Color of Change Pack, I'm on the board of the, um, their board. So it's a lot of stuff that's it's keeping me busy. I'm busier than I normally am. <laughs> right. How about you, Leah? Thank you. I, um, well, you know, first I have my, my church work, and I lead a denomination. Um, I'm just celebrated my first anniversary as the... Uh, as the leader of our church denomination. So that consumes. Congratulations. Uh, thank you. Thank you. And I also have my, uh, I have a consulting firm that does strategic planning and organizational development. And my, my sole project is the work that I do in Appalachia uh, with the American Federation of Teachers and helping rural communities to rebuild themselves. And that's grown into uh, a multi-city effort. So I spent a lot of time in rural America, or I, or I did before the pandemic, uh, helping those communities to figure out their new path in, in this new economy. And of course, then is my political work. Um, I'm, the, I'm the chair of Black Church PAC, uh, which is faith leaders and people of faith banded together to help build Black political power. And I'm on the board of any number of others, NCNW, et cetera, et cetera Higher Heights for America. Uh, so, uh, so I'm busy. That's I'm great. Busy. It's, you're, you're all still very active and in the game. So when you got together, where did you go for vacation? What did you do? Look, I hope you didn't talk politics, but I'm sure you probably did. What, what, what do you like to do when you get together? We definitely don't talk a lot of politics. Oh, yeah. no. We can't even figure out a dinner reservation <laughs> when we're together. <laughs> I think people, people think we talk about what we, when we're together, we don't talk about politics. <laughs> we find everything to talk about with politics. But we were in Greece the summer, actually the summer that Charlottesville ha happened. And we were all that's like right. texting Carrie saying, are you on top of this? Are you looking at this? So that's where we were. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
social media is, is, is changed so much of everything, certainly politics. How much are you on it? How much when you work with clients, do you feel they have to be in that or, or uh, you stay away from it as kind of a toxic environment, certainly Twitter? Um, well, uh, Leah can probably speak to this better than any, any one of us. She is like the Facebook queen. Yeah. And on any given time, you can go on and Leah has engaged at the highest level, at, at the medium level and the lowest level. She is like everybody's like go-to person when it comes to Facebook. Everybody looks to see what she's saying, whether it's pop culture, whether it's politics, you know, <laughs> whether it's looking at an award show and commenting on somebody's dress. It's kind of like the Facebook, Leah has it. You know, I actually engage a little bit in uh, all three of the mediums. And what I, what I try to keep in mind though, when I'm on it is, do you want, can the lawyers review this and feel good about it? Ah. <laughs> yeah, and I'm, you know, I'm, re I'm very, you know, I'm, I, I probably land in the space of not, you know, I'm not overly cautious, but I do try to be careful and try to use it as a medium to just, you know, highlight and have a little fun with it. So, and as it, as it relates to my clients, I think it's inevitable. You have to have some presence on social media. I mean, the world is just moving too quickly to do it the old fashioned way. Right. Uh, how about you, Yolanda? I'm a, fa I'm a Facebook person. Um, I post a lot. I, I, I don't make a lot of comments, but I post a lot. Whenever I see an article or something I think is relevant and that I figure somebody else might be interested in it, so I post the articles. Mm -hmm. I don't do much. I'm on Instagram. I don't do much on Instagram. Uh, and I don't do a lot on Twitter. I'm kind of getting into LinkedIn right now, but that's more of a business thing. Mm -hmm. Right. So Leah, sounds like you're the Facebook uh, leader here. Uh, how much time, it does take time, right? How much time do you spend on it? Not much time on there. I I understand Facebook better than I understand. Like I, I'm just trying to understand Instagram. I don't quite get that, but I do post things there, mainly my knitting. I, I'm a big knitter. So I post pictures of the things that I knit, which people seem to like, I go figure, I don't know. Twitter is a little, you know, it moves fast, but you can get quick information on Twitter. Uh, but you're not building any relationships on Twitter because you're not having any conversations. Right. Facebook is more conversational. And so, but, you know, I don't spend my day on Facebook. I got work to do. <laughs> so, <Right>. <laughs> so, you know, I go on, I see what people are saying. And, you know, if, if I want to get off on a rant on something, I'll put it on Facebook and then you keep moving for clients. You know, I think it's, getting information out there about what you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, we all do enough of this media stuff to know that, you know, when you do, people check your Twitter feed to see what you've yeah. been saying. Exactly. Um, before you go on a show. So, you know, I don't know how many times people have said, so I just read, you said on Twitter. <laughs> so like, oh my God, what did I say on Twitter? <laughs> so, but I think for clients, they have to have some kind of social media presence. Mm -hmm. it's, yeah. It's um, so, this is a, a beautiful book for colored girls who have considered politics. It, it tells your stories. It gives us behind the scene look of, of political campaigns, political conventions. Um, would you consider doing another book together? Was it a positive experience? Are you thinking about a follow-up? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I've been keeping the I've been keeping notes. <laughs> since since, since uh, the book was released on the stuff that we've been doing for this campaign. Oh, you have great. Yeah, you have that. It won't be that painful again. Great. You know, so, it's it's hard to meld f uh, four voices together. <laughs> yeah, it is very. And it was five. It was yeah. five. Yep, Tina Floyd, who's the fifth color girl, she's President Clinton's chief of staff, and she was she wisely backed out under the auspices that she was too busy, of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but she knew the pain points going in. Yeah. Actually, you know, I had a great experience. Though, I thought, yeah, yeah, we got our rhythm. You know, it was really trying to figure out who had time to meet with Veronica. Now Yolanda, see the reason why Yolanda enjoyed the process? Because she thought it was her bio. Well, no, I did what I was told <laughs> well, to do. Autobiography. And then one day me and Leah and Donna looked up and said, 
you know, this book is going to be about Yolanda if we don't get focused. <laughs> She's ain't going to get Audra McDonald for the role. That's what she's she, doing. She, hey! She, she was focused. We were like, dang, she is. I did exactly what I was told to do. <laughs> but what happened was, I, I actually read the manuscript, and then I, I picked, I said, Mignon, have you read this? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't count line by line, but are you saying that Yolanda got more lines than you you two did? No, here, let me do. Uh, no, stay. they fixed that. I would have. I'm going to be a stand down. So me and Donna, one day were on the phone. And so Donna said, have you read the book or have you read the manuscript? I said, well, kind of, sort of, you know, I'm making sure I do what I have to do. She said, well, you know, nine chapters is about Yolanda. <laughs> Eight chapters is about Leah. She said, we come in there some kind of way. I think we better start looking at these chapters. That's the way we decide. But you know what? We were so okay with it because they put the time in. Yolanda put it in. Then Leah came up from the rear. Me and Donna still trying to figure out how we even got in the book because we didn't know what we were supposed to do. Well, Donna got into it. It's like you just start remembering all these things and you want to talk about the stuff that you had done. Things that I had forgotten about. And Donna well, they up the Bank of Justice and they let you in, it sounds like, uh, Mignon, after the uh... Oh, we were like, okay. <laughs> Go ahead, Liv was getting ready to say something. Yeah. I was going to say, Donna had other books, so, you know, she had halfway told her story. But, but when I got the manuscript back and I saw Yolanda's chapters, I said, I better start doing my assignments because Yolanda's doing her assignments. <laughs> <laughs> so that was our process, Paul. That's great. <laughs> Well, you're still friends. You still like to vacation together and things. Um, since we are recording this before the election, and I know you've, you've all been involved in doing your part on the Biden-Harris ticket, um, but since we have uh, Reverend Leah, I thought maybe we would end each of you with, with just something that you would like to put at the end of this, um, maybe in the form of a prayer even, since we have a reverend, or, or just your, your hopes for our country and for whatever happens uh, November 3rd for going together or going forward and how we can come back together or, or come together in some way better as a country. Um, why don't we start with uh, Mignon? Oh, God. Now, this is the one time I wish Leah had started first. I could have really said amen. <laughs> but what I will say, Paul, I think this is 2020. You know, when I came in, when, I, when we were leaving out of 219, I was really hopeful about 220 because I was like, and I was even writing like 2020. I wasn't, you know, doing what we usually do when we're writing checks or writing, writing the dates down. And it felt like it felt good and it felt optimistic. But I think, you know, Leah probably, she, she pointed out the hopeful part of what's happening. And I'm just hoping that the humanity that lives in all of us mm -hmm. will be restored because what's at stake is not us. What is at stake is a generation that has seen all of these cues being transmitted and they don't know how to quite interpret them. And so I'm hoping that at some point we can give them examples of how they want to live their lives out because this is their generation that they're going to inherit everything from the debt to the hope, to yeah. the beauty, to the, so that is my prayer for the country that we see that there is a generation trying to be good and we, we rise to that. And so that's my prayer for the country. Wonderful. Thank you, Mignon. Yolanda, what would you add? I just want to see, I, I want to see more love and caring. Mm -hmm. um, people have just forgotten. I, I don't know what we've forgotten that we're human or, you know, we don't treat people like they're not even human anymore. Mm -hmm. I want to see that. And I'm hope, hopeful that if this administration is gone, then we can get back to the way that we used to be. Mm -hmm. and try to rebuild the country uh, and have some unity. Because mm -hmm. we can't do it, you know, nobody can do it alone. We have, to, we have to band together to try to rebuild everything because we have no idea what's really been torn down at this point. Um, but it's gonna, take a, it's gonna take a village to get us back. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Yolanda. And, and uh, finally, Reverend Leah. <laughs> You know, my prayer would be that these four years have helped us to understand um, 
not only our own individual role and power, but how interconnected we are. Mm -hmm. uh, and that we will build on that, whether it's, whether it's wearing a mask, mm -hmm. staying at home, taking a test, whether it's marching in the street with someone, whether it's how we connect with each other and now really appreciating how the value of our communities that we will build on what have been hard won lessons these four years. And that we will see and understand our resilience and our strength and look to the future, grabbing someone else's hand as we go, recognizing that we are not in this alone, that community is important, that each of us is important and each one of us has a role to play, whether it's wearing a mask, washing mm -hmm. your hands, or casting your vote. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. You've been very inspiring. I really appreciate uh, your time. This was a, a wonderful conversation. You gave us a lot to think about. Hopefully the, the, the next generation, the young people that you all, we've all talked about will step forward. And um, this was really wonderful. We're so thankful for the co-authors or for Color Girls who have considered politics with us today, Mignon Moore, Yolanda Carraway, and Leah Daughtry. Thank you so much for being part of this. Thank you for having us.